That hymn has been sung for a few hundred years now. Um, not by me. Um, I've only sung it for about 50 of them. Um, but it's still a remarkable song, isn't it? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. And that's, that's the obligation that comes with Good Friday. When we think of the sacrifice of Jesus, when we think of the difference that he has made in our lives, how could we withhold from him the worship that he deserves? How could we do anything other than give him our lives and our service and our love and our commitment? It's Good Friday, in case you didn't know. I've always thought Good Friday is a rather curious name for today because what's good about Jesus dying? If you think of all the other celebrations of the, the, the anniversary of the death of somebody famous, very few of them are called good. I, I was looking in my diary the other day and somebody uh, pointed out to me it's the anniversary of Nelson Mandela's uh, birth on the same day as my wedding anniversary. Somebody asked me if he'd been disappointed that he hadn't been invited to the wedding. Um, but no, I don't think he was too bothered about that, to be honest. There are various celebrations that take place in life, but it's strange to celebrate the death of somebody. It's strange to call the day that Jesus died a good day. But I want to say to you today, in just about 10 minutes or so, actually it's more than just a good day. Good Friday is a fantastic day because on the cross of Calvary, four amazing things happened that changed the course of history, that transformed our lives. What are those four things? The first one of those four things is this, that God's promises were fulfilled. God's promises were fulfilled. You know, if you look at the Good Friday story as an outsider, the cross must have looked like a defeat to many people, to the Romans who were around there, to the Jewish leaders who campaigned for the death of Jesus, to the spiritual forces of darkness. I'm sure they thought, that's it. We've got what we wanted. We've accomplished what we set out to do. We've defeated Jesus. He is dead. God's plan is finished and is over. And not only to the enemies of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus too uh, thought very plainly that it was all over for them. If you look at the resurrection stories, then you can tell that they were astonished. Even, Josie, even though Jesus had promised them that he would be raised again to life, they were astonished that he was. They thought that was the end. They say uh, to one another, we had thought that he might have been the one. We thought that he was the answer. We thought that he was the one that God sent. Everybody thought the cross was a disaster, a failure. But actually, it was the moment of God at his greatest power. It was the most amazing moment in human history. The powers of darkness hadn't thwarted, hadn't defeated God's plan. They'd actually brought it about. You see, the plan that God had put in place starts in the Garden of Eden. It starts at the very beginning of time when Adam and Eve turn away from God, when they rebel against God. Even right back at that start of history, back in Genesis 3, God says to the serpent who'd um, tricked them, who'd caused them to fall into, into sin, because you've done this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, there is somebody coming who will be born of a woman who will defeat you. He will strike your head. Your kingdom, Satan, uh, will be destroyed by this person. And yes, you'll bruise his heel. Yes, you'll harm him. Yes, you'll cause him uh, great suffering. But he will defeat you. That was always God's plan, that on the cross, it wouldn't be a defeat for Jesus. It would be a defeat for the powers of darkness. You know, there are so many other prophecies. Time and time again, the, the promises of the Bible are fulfilled in Jesus. Many, many times, if you read the Gospels, the four, the four books of the New Testament that tell us about Jesus, time and time again, it describes there, Jesus did this to fulfill what had been said in the uh, Old Testament about him. Many, many times. And one of the most precious of all of those a passage that we think of perhaps a lot at this time of year. 
Isaiah chapter 53. This too is fulfilled in the death of Jesus. It says there, surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. We thought he wasn't worth bothering with. We thought we'd misunderstood it. We thought he had failed like all the other people who'd come before. But he was wounded, the prophet goes on and says, for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities those are big words but they basically means that the, the sins the failures the mistakes the bad things that we do okay um our sin our refusal to follow god's plan for our lives is what caused jesus to have to go to the cross he was wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities upon him was the punishment that made us all and by his bruises we are healed what an amazing promise that is. I don't know about you, but it's been a bruising few years. <laughs> there, are, there are wounds, there are bruises in my life, and I'm sure in everyone's life here today that need healing, we can only find that in Jesus. That's a pretty amazing thing that happened at the cross of Calvary. The second amazing thing, and don't worry, I'm going to speed up a little bit, is that on the cross of Calvary, God's own son suffered and died why is that amazing because you need to remember what people at the time would have thought that it was that the world that jesus lived in 2000 years ago was dominated by greek philosophy and as far as the greeks were concerned god was unknowable uh, god was kind of perfect and and pure and holy but you could never come into contact with with him and he could never suffer he could never have emotions he could never have feelings that's not the God that you find revealed in the Bible. The God that we see in the Bible is touched with the feelings of compassion for us. He cares for us. He loves us. He feels very deeply and very passionately about us. He's not some distant God who's forgotten about us. And he asks his son to pay the penalty for our sin, for our failure. Whereas gods to the Greeks were unchangeable, immortal, untouched by human emotions. Jesus coming and Jesus dying represents a change in the very nature of God. The son of God takes on human flesh to be like me and to be like you. And he's willing not only to take on that human flesh, but to surrender it. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, the Bible says. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, even the very worst kind of suffering that he could go through. He did that because he loved us. He did that because it was the only way there was hope for us. He did that because it was the only way that we could know what it is to have a relationship with the Father and with God. Death had no power over him, but he submitted to death so that he might destroy death. The third thing that happens at the cross is that Jesus pays the penalty and the price for all our sins and for all our failures. There's this beautiful verse in 1 Peter in the New Testament that says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There's that phrase again reminding you of the words of Isaiah. Jesus died because we deserved to. <laughs> Jesus died because we'd rebelled against God. And the Bible says the only appropriate punishment for rebelling against God is eternal separation from God, eternal death. But Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. That's why we're here today. That's why we're so grateful. That's why we can sing, love so amazing demands my life, my soul, my all, because he didn't deserve what he suffered. He didn't deserve to pay the penalty, but he did it nevertheless. And that means fourthly and finally, perhaps the most amazing of all of these things, that forgiveness is open to everyone. I came across a verse that I'd never really seen and never really latched onto in Psalm 
65 and verse 3, and it says this. The psalm is talking to God. He says, God, when we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. When we'd failed you, when we'd let you down, when we'd rebelled against you time and time again, we were overwhelmed by our sin. You forgave us. Isn't that glad? Isn't, isn't that something to be glad about uh, this morning? Isn't that something to rejoice in? You know, if you, if you ever, I'm sure none of you in this room today would ever dream of doing this, but if you ever do something bad or wrong or mess up or kind of get something, Cyril's laughing, I don't know why, uh, <laughs> uh, Cyril never does anything wrong like me. Um, you, you, you know what it's like, don't you, where you mess up and you think, oh dear, so-and-so is going to be really upset about that or I've kind of spilt something on the carpet or I'm going to get real trouble when Leslie gets home. It's probably the other way around with us, actually. There's a sense of awkwardness and uncomfortableness, isn't there? Okay? You're thinking, oh dear, um, even though I know she said or he said, I'm forgiven. I know they said it's all right, but next time I see them, I'm just going to keep my head down a little bit. Let me tell you this. When God forgives us, he forgets about the sin that he's forgiven. Right? Next time we come into God's presence, we don't need to keep going on about things that he's already forgiven. Yeah? We don't need to feel awkward or uncomfortable in God's presence. We can boldly approach the throne of God through Jesus because we come not in our own strength, not because we're good people, because we're all pretty good people, but none of us is good enough. Okay? We come not because we're good people, but because Jesus, who didn't deserve to die, died in our place to pay the penalty for our sin. And I don't know about you, but I think those things are pretty amazing. I think together those things mean that today is a day worth celebrating, a day that we can call good, because our lives have been transformed by the power of the cross. Yeah.